Hello everyone, this is Dr. Vishal Tivedi from Department of Biosciences and Bioengineering IIT Guwahati and what we were discussing, we were discussing about the recombinant DNA technology and so far what we have discussed, we have discussed about the different property, different applications of the recombinant DNA technology. So if you recall, in the previous two lectures, we have discussed how you can be able to use the recombinant DNA technology to produce the transgenic uh, organisms. So, in the lecture number one, we have discussed about the transgenic plants and how the transgenic plants are having the uh, different types of utilities in terms of uh, increasing the productivity and as well as in terms of reducing the losses. Apart from that, uh, in the previous lecture, we have also discussed about the transgenic animals. So, we have discussed about the different types of transgenic animals, we have discussed about the how they can be useful for drug screening, how they can be useful for understanding the disease mechanisms and how they can be useful in terms of producing a particular uh, proteins so that those proteins can be used for different types of applications in the medical industry and, uh, and so on. Uh, apart from that, we have also discussed about the concerns over utilizing the transgenic animals. So, we have discussed about what are the advantage of using the transgenic uh, organisms versus what are the drawbacks. So, uh, with this brief discussion about the transgenic animals, uh, we are going to move on to the next topic and our the next topic is the antisense technology and uh, apart from that, we are also going to discuss about the more applications of the genetic engineering and the recombinant DNA technology. So, what is antisense technology? Antisense technology as you can see is a technique which is widely used to silence the expression of the certain genes with the help of the short oligonucleotide that bind to their specific site. So, antisense technology is being used to reduce the expression of a particular gene. Uh, you will understand the utility of this uh, reducing the expression of the gene in a latter part, but uh, in some cases uh, you what we have is uh, suppose you want a, you do not want the expression of a gene, then you have two approaches. Uh, you either you can actually be able to remove this gene from the genome or when this gene is actually going to form the messenger RNA, you can devise a mechanism so that the messenger RNA is going to be degraded. Either of these cases, the this gene will not be able to give you the protein and as a result, it is actually going to uh, give you the, uh, the same kind of phenotype what you are going to get when the protein is being inhibited or protein is being removed from the circulations. So, there are two ways in which the antisense technology works. In uh, uh, approach number one, you can be able to use the antisense oligonucleotides. So, the antisense oligonucleotides are the short oligonucleotide which bind to their corresponding complementary messenger RNA sequence. The binding of antisense oligonucleotide to their complementary sequence results in the blockage of translation. So, this is the antisense uh, oligonucleotide technology where you are going to synthesize the antisense oligonucleotide which is complementary to the messenger RNA. So, as a result what will happen is that it is actually going to form a double stranded RNA. You know that the RNA is single stranded when then only it is actually going to recognize by the protein synthesis machinery and as a result it is actually going to give you the protein. So, when the RNA is double stranded, uh, it is actually going to block the, uh, it is actually going to block the ribosome to bind, right. So, there will be a steric hindrance to the ribosome and that is how the ribosome will not be able to bind and proceed beyond this point and that is how it is actually going to reduce or actually abolishes the protein production. The other approach is whenever you have a double stranded RNA, this kind of RNA, it is going to be targeted by an enzyme which is called as RNA-H and the RNA-H is actually going to degrade the 
messenger RNA into the multiple pieces and as a result it is actually also going to reduce the uh, protein synthesis from this messenger RNA. The second approach is called as RNA interference. So, uh, in another mechanism these oligonucleotides mediate the degradation of the complementary um, um, RNA via the RNAH mediated degradation. The degradation of messenger RNA by the antisense oligonucleotide or other complementary RNA system is often known as the RNA interference or the RNI. Another type of silencing technique is called as siRNAs commonly used for targeting the RNI pathway. There is a very simple difference between the siRNA and the antisense oligonucleotide uh, technology which comes into the play when silencing a certain gene expressions. In siRNA there is a complex system of protein which is called as RSIC which incorporate the siRNA, scans the target messenger RNA and ultimately degrade the target using the nuclease activity. Several other applications have been developed both in research and industry using the antisense oligonucleotide and the siRNA and RNAs have been one of the routinely been used uh, techniques to silence the uh, gene expressions. Now what are the concerns over the genetically modified organisms? So, uh, there will be a corporate control over the GMOs which might result in skewed uh, socio-economic scenarios. So, this is all this is about, about the antisense technology what we have discussed uh, we have uh, discussed about the uh, antisense oligonucleotide technology and we have also discussed about the antisense RNA interference. The mechanisms are almost the same, but the machinery is different right. So, in the case of this uh, RNA um, technique you are actually going to use the RSIC mediated uh, protein different proteins like the dicers and RSIC and all that, but ultimately the it is actually going to degrade the uh, messenger RNAs. Similarly, in the antisense oligonucleotide the once you have the double stranded RNA then it is actually going to be a target by the RNAs H and RNAs H is actually going to degrade the RNA into the small pieces. Now let us move on to the next uh, uh, topic and the next topic is the gene therapy. So gene therapy uh, several diseases must result from the faulty gene. So what is the requirement of a gene therapy that because you are actually going to have the mutant genes or you are actually going to have the non-functional genes and these genes can be replaced or can be used for uh, can cause actually the certain type of disease. So, uh, several disease results from the faulty genes these disease can be categorized into the two types monogenic and the polygenic. Gene therapy is a medical field focused on the treating or preventing the disease by the modifying the gene within a person's cell, right. It involves altering the genetic material with a patient's cell to treat or prevent the disease. This can be done by either replacing, inactivating or introducing the new gene into the cell. The primary goal is to correct or compensate for the abnormal genes or to make a beneficial proteins. The obvious candidate disease for gene therapy includes an immune disorders such as the several common immunodeficiency or SKIT and the inheritable genetic disorders such as cystic fibrosis, hemophilia and the muscular dystrophy. Now what is the requirement, what is the need of the gene therapy? The need of the gene therapy is that if you have the dysfunctional gene you have the two options either you actually going to supply the proteins by an exogenous source and that could be very very uh, challenging and uh, that is that actually going to have a lot of problems because it is actually going to cause the allergic reactions and all those kind of things. The other approach is that you can actually be able to just uh, you know mutate the genome or mutate the particular cell in such a way that it is actually going to replace the the faulty genes it can actually inactivate the faulty genes or you can actually be able to introduce the new copy of the gene into uh, the same place so that the faulty gene is going to be removed and the new gene is actually going to be inserted into the genome. Now there are multiple approaches one can use for gene therapy. So there are uh, three main uh, approaches for the gene therapy you have the gene augmentations. Uh, 
therapy, so gene augmentation therapy, this is a general uh, major strategy in gene therapy. This strategy is aimed to replace or add the gene that caused the disease. The faulty gene is replaced with a functional gene copy. The example is this kit or the severe combined immunodeficiency often caused by the ADA gene mutations. So, gene replacement therapy uh, can introduce a functional ADA gene to restore the immune functions. And the first gene therapy was performed in 1990 in a four year, goals, uh, four year girl suffering from skit. A functional copy of the ADA gene was inserted into the viral vector which was then introduced into the lymphocytes collected from the patient and these lymphocytes were then reintroduced into the patient bloodstream. The immune system functioning of the patient improves but the cure was not permanent. So, this is the gene augmentation therapy and then you have the gene inhibition therapy. So, gene in the gene augmentation therapy what you are going to do is you are going to see in you have a faulty gene right. So, what you are going to do is you are going to have the two options one you can actually be able to put the functional gene. So, you can actually be able to get the functional gene from the other source and then you just put that into a vector and then you can insert that functional gene into the particular cell type or target cell type. The second option is the gene inhibition therapy where you actually have the faulty genes. So, you can act and that faulty gene is producing the different types of uh, non desirable products. So, you can actually be able to do the insert insertion of a inhibitory gene so that the that particular function is going to be reduced. So, this is the simple examples of the uh, uh, removal of the ADA deficiency T cells from the skid patient. So, if you suppose you have a skid patient, so you can what you can do is you can just remove the T cells uh, from the uh, patient, then you can culture these T cells into the bone marrow uh, sorry the in the laboratory with the help of the uh, synthetic media. And then what you are going to do is you are going to infect these T cells with a retrovirus that contain the normal ADA genes. So, but when this will happen the, the retrovirus is actually going to deliver the ADA gene into the genome of this particular culture T cells. And then re in then you can reinfuse this ADA gene containing T cells back into the skin protein genetically altered T cells produce the ADA. And if you expect if you do so you expect that this ADA gene is actually going to provide the necessary functional outcomes and that is how you actually going to convert that T cell into a functional T cell and that functional T cell is actually going to uh, work against the, uh, the infectious organisms. Uh, but uh, many of the places uh, uh, in fact, what we have just discussed that when it was being done in a girl, uh, it was not giving the permanent cure because these T cells are being produced from the bone marrow right. So, so uh, when the T cells are being produced from the bone marrow and these T cells are short lived right. So, uh, they will functional and as long as these T cells are functional right these T cells are having the life. The T cells are going to die uh, and then these, these cells T cells are actually going to be eliminated. So, you are producing the functional T cells, but those T cells are not permanent. So, that is why it is important that you should do all the modification in the bone marrow. So, that the T cells are going to be produced from the bone marrow then they will go into the thymus for the training and from the thymus they will enter into the circulations. Then the second approach uh, is called as gene inhibition therapy. So, gene inhibition therapy blocks the expression or function of a gene causing the disease. This approach is beneficial for condition where the reducing the activity of a specific gene can have the therapeutic uh, benefits. The gene inhibition approach of the gene therapy is applicable in the case of infectious disease, cancer and mutated gene whose uh, products cause disease. For example, the sickle cell anemia, Tysia disease, phenylcotounia and blood, blood uh, color blindness. So, these are the some of the diseases where the gene product is actually not useful or it is harmful actually. So, in those cases what you can do is you can just put the gene inhibition which means you can actually be able to do so that uh, the gene which you is causing this problem can be inhibited. So, in a gene inhibition approach a gene is introduced into a whole cell where product either block the expression of the faulty gene or disarm the productivity or products of the faulty genes. 
then gene repair or the gene editing this kind of gene therapy involves the editing of the faulty gene at a genomic level of the in disease individual several strategies like the talens zinc uh, finger nucleases and more recently the crispr cas9 system has been precisely used to edit the genome genomic dna so in the third approach you can actually be able to use the gene repair or the gene editing you might have heard recently that people have done the uh, using this uh, crispr cas9 genome editing approach to altered the genome of a individual or in genome of a baby right in china and that's how it is actually going to be cured against the different types of diseases so this is a very very good strategy where you can actually be able to uh, alter the genome of an individual but it also has some of the ethical concern and that also can be taken into consideration when you are trying to edit a genome of an individuals so uh, in the genome editing or the repair therapy what you are doing is you are taking the uh, you know edited genome so what you are going to do is you take the take out the genome and then you edit the uh, the particular gene fragment or you actually edit the mutations and then you will put that into the cell again and that's how it is actually going to produce the functional proteins based on the approach so th these are the strategies uh, for the gene therapy when you are talking about the uh, delivery of a particular gene product so based on the approach of the gene delivery gene therapy can be classified into two type either it will be a uh, in vivo gene therapy or the uh, or the in in vitro gene therapy so in the in vivo uh, which is directly going to the uh, living organism or the ex vivo which is outside the something which is alive which means uh, ex vivo means which is going to be within the cell in vivo which is inside the organisms so in the ex vivo gene therapy the cells of the diseased persons are taken out of the body and then functional genes are incorporated into the cell this technique is also known as the cell based delivery in the direct delivery method or the in vivo method the normal functioning genes are directly inserted into the cell and the tissue of the disease individuals so this is what it is going to say that if you are going to use the in vivo approach you are actually going to insert the the gene therapy directly into the organisms if it is ex vivo then it is going to be uh, into the cell so it is actually you are going to isolate the cells uh, just like as we have seen that this example from the skit so you can actually be able to isolate the t cells from the individual then you uh, manipulate the t cells with the help of the different types of gene therapy approaches and then you put these uh, mutated or modified t cells back into the patient then based on the cell type uh, the, uh, the the gene therapy can be classified into two types you can actually have the somatic gene therapy or you can actually have the germline gene therapy so in the somatic sense gene therapy in somatic gene therapy the functional copies of the target genes are introduced into the patients somatic cells remember that somatic means the cell which are actually making the all different body parts except the germ lines okay so which means like for example if you have a problem in skin you have a problem in liver you have a problem in lungs uh, something like that okay so these are the somatic uh, tissues whereas the testes and the ovaries are been called as the uh, germ line uh, or gonads actually so in this uh, case the germline gene therapy the genes are delivered directly into the germ cells such as the egg or the sperm the functional genes inserted in the germ cells are inheritable and can also cause the changes into the progeny so in the germline therapy what you uh, so is in the somatic gene therapy it is actually going to give the cure to individual which means suppose a individual is having a some kind of functional defects into the lungs into the liver into the brain into the other kinds of things then you can actually be able to treat that with the help of the somatic gene therapy but in the germline therapy it is going to be for the generations so even the if you do, do the treatment into the father it is actually going to be transmitted into the son because uh, the but you are going to do the treatment into the sperm or the germ lines actually so this is the ex 
uh, vivo, this is the in vivo, so where you are actually going to use the organisms in the ex vivo you are going to take out the cell, then you are going to mutate this and then you are going to take the mutated cell and put it back into the patients. There are examples uh, so, uh, of the gene therapy where the people have done the gene therapy treatments and they, they could got the uh, enormous successful right. So, one first example is the cystic fibrosis. So, cystic fibrosis is a autosomal recessive inheritable disease caused by a defective membrane protein as cystic fibrosis transmembrane conductant regulator or CFTR protein. The defective protein is produced due to a mutation in the CFTR gene. Deletion of a single amino acid in the protein result in the incorrect by protein biosynthesis and holding. Due to the defective protein, the movement of the salt and water is hampered into the body cell causing the thick uh, sticky mucus build up into the respiratory tract thereby causing the severe injuries to both the respiratory tract and the gastrointestinal tract. So, uh, what is the treatment uh, available for the uh, cystic fibrosis? You can actually be able to put the cystic CFTR modulators. So, drug like the Efacaftor or Lumanafcaftor and the Tezacaftor helps to improve the function of the defective CFTR proteins. Then you can be able to put the antibiotics, the antibiotic is used to treat and prevent the lung infections. Then you can actually be able to put the mucus thinners. So, medications like the uh, Dornasa alpha or help this mucus in the lungs. Then you can also put the bronchiolite dilators to so help the airways and then you can also put the inflammatory ducts and that will reduce the inflammation into the airways. So, the exactly what happens into the cystic fibrosis is that there will be a mutation into the CFTR gene and because of that it is actually going to develop a very thick layer of mucus into the, uh, into the uh, air passage which means it is in, into the trachea. And because of this, it is actually going to be difficult for the patient to breathe actually. And uh, this is going to be very thick. So, it is actually going to lower down the uh, lower down the air passage okay. and that is how the person is actually going to develop the hypoxia and other kinds of problems. So, in a, CF, a normal CFTR gene replaces the mutate gene, the disease can be cured. So, what you are going to do in this case is you are going to take out the normal uh, CFTR genes and then you can actually be able to do the genome editing for the CFTR using the CRISPR Cas or any kind of these genome editing techniques. And then you can actually be able to use the editing of the genome level and that is how you can put these back into the individual and that is how it is actually going to cure the disease uh, the person from the cystic fibrosis. Now, the question comes if it is so useful. Um, can we can we say that the gene therapy is a is a is a gift for the human being let's discuss uh, what are the different uh, uh, what is the advantage and the disadvantage of the gene therapy so gene therapy whether it is a boon or the curse for the human being okay so gene therapy has the tremendous potential for treating the many condition but it comes with the various challenges and the risk. The following point outline the merits and demerits of a very powerful technique that undergo the right conditions, hold the potential to change the demography of a human suffering. So, what are the merits? Gene therapy has the potential to treat the devastating inherited disease for which the conventional strategies provide very little hope. So, this is a very very important and because of which the people have started using the gene therapy. So, where you can actually be able to use the inhibitors, where you can be able to use the enhancers, you can be able to avoid the gene therapy. But in some cases uh, when you have the mutations, there is no cure for the mutations. Then the human genomics have provided us with the genetic basis of most cancers and idea how to cure them. Gene therapy is the most common promising tool that can help us to manipulate the cells at the genomic level. And the third is the most important advantage of the therapy is that the targeting of the therapy. It is considered a modern type of precision medicine as it can be tailored to every patient's specific needs. This allows for the highly precise intervention that can correct or mitigate the effect of specific genetic mutations. Now, what are the disadvantage of the gene therapy? There were several demerits of this upcoming uh, strategy which is still in the process of being foolproof. 
there are increased problem of insertional mutagenesis which is the inability to control the site of integration of the gene of interest at a genomic level. So, this is a very very important and serious concern that sometime when you are doing these insertional mutagenesis and you are trying to replace the defective gene you are putting the correct gene. Uh, it happens that it instead of uh, getting the insertion at the right place, it actually get the insertion at a uh, off, off sites and that is how it is actually going to create more and more complications. The insertion of a foreign genetic material always risks eliciting an immune response. The safe delivery of the genetic material is still in the research phase. The durability and the efficacy of these treatments are still, uh, are still recognized by the several researchers. Editing germline cell raises several ethical concerns and it can affect the future generations. So, it is actually uh, there is one of the major uh, ethical concern is that you are actually going to generate the genetically genetically uh, modified um, humans right. So, you are actually can be uh, have the potential of generating a genetically modified humans or transgenic humans actually if I say like that ok. And that is a very very problematic because once you are actually going to start approving these kind of protocols where a person can be uh, modified its genome with the help of these kind of approaches or with these kind of protocols, uh, it may not be uh, controlled over only at the level of uh, treating the disease, it could be even beyond that right. And that could actually uh, have a very very significant uh, side effects on the future generations. Finally, the high cost of the therapeutic strategy has made it difficult for the accessibility to the commoner. So, that is the very very important that the therapy itself is a very very costly. So, this is all about the recombinant DNA technology, we have discussed about the antisense technology, we have also discussed about the gene therapy. Now, if you see uh, the, the recombinant DNA technology is producing a recombinant clone and that recombinant clone is ultimately uh, is being used to produce the different types of proteins right, proteins or the enzyme. And uh, these proteins and the enzyme production is also be very very useful in giving you the different types of treatment regimes and it can also be very very useful for the industrial outcomes. One of the such industry is the food industry where you can be able to use the different types of enzymes. So, these uh, recombinant uh, products uh, can be used for the, uh, for the food industry. Let us see how you can be able to use the different types of enzyme into the food industry. So, if you talk about the food industry, it has the four major uh, uh, branches. You have the dairy industry, you have the brewing industry, you have the baking industry, you have the wine industry and then you also have the meat industry. And all of these industries are using the different types of enzymes. For example, in the dairy industry, you are using the rennet, lactose, protease and catalyst for different types of application which we are going to discuss in a subsequent uh, slides. Then in the brewing industry which is responsible for producing the beer and the other kinds of alcoholic beverages, then you can actually be able to use the beta gluconose, alpha amylase, proteases and the myoglobins. Then you also have the baking industry where you are going to use baking industry is producing the bread or the other kinds of baking products where you are using the maltogenic glucose and the pentose. Then you also have the uh, um, wine and the food industry where you are using the uh, pectinase and the beta gluconase. Then we also have the meat industry we are using the proteases and the papain. Let's discuss uh, the relevance of these enzymes. So, all these enzymes are recombinant enzyme which you can actually be able to use into the food industry. And uh, earlier when until the recombinant technology was not available all these enzymes were added uh, from the uh, rich sources and uh, in that cases you always have the non desirable product as well. So, the first is uh, the dairy industry. In the dairy industry, you have the four different enzymes. You have the rennets, you have the lactose, you have a protease and you have a catalase which you are going to use. So, rennet 
is a first enzyme it is extracted from the stomach of the young calf that, that was in the when the, there was no recombinant DNA technology. The enzyme contains that it causes the milk to become the cheese, it separates the solid curd and the liquid whey and uh, different animal rennets are being used for the different types of cheese and uh, most uh, common vegetable rennet is the thistle. So, the rennet is converting the milk into cheese and you can be able to use the recombinant uh, rennet uh, to uh, enhance the production of the cheese. Then we have the lactase. So, you know the lactase job is to reduce the lactose uh, into the food product. Okay. So, the, it is present in the brush border of the small intestine. It is artificially extracted from the yeast. So, it, you are producing the rennet uh, sorry lactase into the yeast. It is required for the digestion of the whole milk and used in the production of lactose free milk. Do you know that the lactose free milk is a very big market in the US and other, other countries because many people have the lactose tolerance and uh, if, if there is a lactose sugar is present into the milk, it is actually going to cause the uh, stomach upset and the other kinds of complications. So, uh, the, with the help of the lactase enzyme, you can be able to make the lactose free milk and that actually can be used for the patients. It is also used in the production of ice cream and the sweetened flavored and the condensed milk. Then we have the catalase. So, catalase is to uh, used for the uh, it is going to be used for the breaking down the hydrogen peroxide to water and the oxygen mo molecular oxygen. So, along with the glucose oxidase it is used in treating the food wrappers to prevent the oxidations. It is also used to remove the traces of hydrogen peroxide in the process of cold sterilization. Then we have the proteases, uh, proteases are job is to degrade the proteins. So, uh, it hydrolyzes the specific peptide bond to generate the para casein and the macro peptide in the production of cheese. It results in the bitter flavor into the cheese and also in a desirable textures. Now, let us move on to the breathing industry. So, in the breathing industry you are going to use the proteases, beta gluconols, alpha amylase and the amyloglucosidase and all of these enzymes are being used in the different steps of the breathing industries. So, proteases, uh, proteases works to break down the large protein which enhance the head retention of the beer and reduces the haze. In fully modified malt, these enzymes have done their work during the malting process. Then we have the beta gluconase. So, beta gluconase represent a group of carbohydrate enzyme which break down the glycosidic bond within the beta glucon. It aids in the filtration after mashing and brewing. Then we have the alpha amylase which converts the starch to dextrin in producing the corn syrup. It solubilizes the carbohydrate found in barley and other cereals used in the brewing. It decreases the time required for the mashing. Then we have the baking industry. In the baking industry, you have the maltogenic amylase, glucose oxidase and the pentonases. Maltogenic glucose, uh, maltogenic amylase, it is a flour supplement. It has the anti stalling effects. It modifies the starch while most of the starch starts to gelatinize. It results into the starch granules become more flexible during the storage. Then we have the glucose oxidase. So, it oxidizes the glucose and produces the gluconic acid and the hydrogen peroxide. Hydrogen peroxide is a strong oxidizing agent that strengthens the disulfide and the non disulfide cross linkage in the gluteins. Good working conditions help the proper functioning of the baking systems. Then we have the pentonases. So, exact mechanism is not yet discovered, but Im improves the dove uh, mechanability, yielding a more flexible, easier to handle uh, dove. The dove is very stable and give better oven spring during the baking. Then we have the wine and the food industry, where you are going to use the recombinant pectinases and the recombinant beta gluconases. So, pectinases uh, it prevents the pectin from the forming haze and hence to get the clear solutions. Additionally, used for the extraction of the color and the juice from the fresh fruit, it breaks down the pectin and releases the methanol, and high amount is very hazardous. 
Then we have the beta gluconase, so it accelerates the all biological mechanisms linked to the maturation in on leaves, reduces the maturation durations and it improves the clarification and filtration and improves the action of the finning reagents. And then we talk about the meat industry, in the meat industry you are using mostly the two enzyme, it is the protease, the other is the papain, papain is also a protease actually. Uh, which you are going to use. So, mostly the protease are being used for the meat tenderizations. So, proteases uh, cleave the bond that holds the amino acid together as an enzyme breaks apart which disrupt or loosen the muscle fiber and tenderize it. So, when you are going to treat the meat with the proteases, it is actually going to make the meat soft so that it is easy for digestion. Then we also using the papain. So, papain is a protease which is found in papaya. 95 percent of meat tenderization uh, tenderizers available in grocery shops are made from papain. It is extracted from the latex in papaya fruits. These enzymes are purified and sold in powder or the liquid forms. So, this is all about the, uh, the, uh, the uh, applications of the recombinant technology what we have discussed. So, what we have discussed, we have discussed about the gene therapy, we have discussed about the antisense technology, we have discussed about the gene therapy, we have discussed about the ex vivo and in vivo gene therapy, we have discussed about the CFTR treatment using the gene therapy and then we also discussed about the advantage and the disadvantage of the gene therapy. So, with this uh, brief discussion about the uh, antisense technology and as well as the gene therapy. I would like to conclude my lecture here. In our subsequent lecture, we are going to discuss some more aspects related to the application of the combinant DNA technology. Thank you.